Welcome everyone. Thanks for settling in. My name is Terry Griffiths. I'm a select board chair in town. I'm happy and excited along with Steve Castle of TCTV fame and his crew, moderator John Graves to my right, uh, the senior community, the town of Templeton Senior Community Center, which is the building that we're in, and its staff, um, the director Jackie Prime and administrator Cindy Shea, to bring you coffee with the candidates. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen for Templeton, Tim Toth, and Mr. Jeffrey Bennett. Good morning, gentlemen. I'd also like to give a sh big shout out to my husband Greg, the coffee connoisseur. Without uh, without him, we wouldn't have uh, coffee with the candidates. Thank you very much. <laughs> You'd be surprised. It's kind of tricky on how much coffee to how much water and when you have to turn it on, and you know. <laughs> so. <clears throat> Let's see, and the many contributors of baked goods uh, to make this event what it is. Um, it's my hope that we can honor our candidates by bringing passion, our passion, to this forum through mutual love and respect for each other, our communities, state, and great country by expressing our feelings, beliefs, and opinions without criticism, threats, or heaven forbid, violence. I'm grateful to John Graves for taking the role on the role of moderator and give him the floor at this time. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see people here. It's nice that the candidates showed up. Um, so we're going to have the, each candidate's going to speak for three to five minutes or so, and then we're going to have questions from the audience. And uh, I would just like that. Excuse me, John. The mic is not on. It's not on. They can't hear in the back. It's not for The mics are only for the TV. Do you guys want to move up front? Oh, let's put it down. Okay, okay louder. Okay. Sorry. It's all right. <laughs> I'm naturally loud. Right. Um, okay, so we're going to have the candidates. Is going to speak each. Uh, each going to speak for about five minutes. Three to five minutes, and then we're going to have about uh, 18 to 15, 18 minutes of questions. Um, I just ask that anyone who brought um, staff with them to please let the residents ask questions first, and then if you do have questions that you want to ask, if your staff has them or whatnot, that's fine. We're good with that. Um, so I, I, we just let's just keep this, you know, what it's meant to be informative. You can learn. You can ask questions. We're just trying to learn more about what's going on, what they want to do for us, what they can, what they've done. Uh, and if you have any questions relevant to to their campaigns or what you've seen or how they voted on on an art, on an article or, or a law or anything like that. So I guess without further ado, Mr. Jeffrey Sosa Packett. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Good. Okay, so very good. So I need to know how much I can carry my voice. Um, I'm Jeffrey Sosa Packett. I'm running for Congress. In District 2 of Massachusetts, I'm running against Congressman Jim McGovern. Now, I'm running for Congress because I believe that I'm here to solve problems, not create problems. We've had so many different things that have happened in our country over the preceding, let's just take the last decade and stuff. And, you know, I start from a place of understanding that Republicans and Democrats have done a major disservice to us. I wish I could be able to say that one party over the other didn't put us in this position, but we did. During COVID, we lost 44% of our small businesses across District 2. And so no apology happens there for all these families that close their businesses, that are standing with their lawyers, with bankruptcies being filed and houses being foreclosed on because we did not allow our small businesses to reopen. For the businesses that are allowed and that we survived, I'm one of those survivors, right? My business survived. Now, when we think about question one in Massachusetts, we want to tax people. So if I want to sell my child care centers and stuff, and that's my retirement, they want to tax it with my properties. Or if we think of our farmers or any of those situations or our seniors, that have built up their retirements and they want to go sell their homes, we're going to tax them. We must all vote no on question one. 
that state, I want to move on to federal <coughs> and stuff. What we've recognized or what I've watched in the last 19 months of campaigning is there were some very uh, pointed things that bothered me just as a citizen, having nothing to do with politics. One of the things and stuff that we always hear, right, is pay to play out of our candidates. What we all need to do, and I understand people don't have the time, like me, who's a geek, in looking at everybody's donations. But what I want everybody to look at, whether it's Democrat or Republican, unfortunately here in Massachusetts, it's going to be more Democrat that we're looking at, but I can assure you the same game is played on the Republican side. We put our hands up as politicians and say, we bought grant money to this community to do X. What I want everyone to look at is, look at their donations and figure out in these not-for-profits and stuff where their donations came from and then track it back to the grant. <laughs> we need to fix this from the federal side. Operating child care centers, I sign a federal contract every single year of what the rules are and what I can do and what I cannot do. We need to write rules. Right now, all legislators from Massachusetts to the federal government are all Democrats. There is no balance to push back on rules and the way that states can spend money and stuff. So we need to rewrite into the rules the way things get spent. Because when we, again, come back to our small businesses that were lost, what did our state legislators do with the federal money during COVID? One, our schools got money, right? Our schools were closed because we needed to up our ventilation systems, right? One school district, one in 68 communities in my district had anything done to their ventilation. Where's the money? Why did you close our schools? Why did you put us out of business? Then our state legislators turned around and took the federal money, spent it, put a 20-year, $7 billion tax on the remaining small businesses so that they can run around and talk about their pet projects to build a dog park or some walking park. We talk about food insecurities. All we hear, right? Food insecurities, food insecurities. Boston Globe says 1.4 million citizens in Massachusetts in 2021 experience food insecurity. Okay. We spent as a country $18 trillion dollars in the last 10 years on the war on poverty, stripping out health insurance and social security. Yeah, and, can you, can you wrap it up? Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and so we've got to basically put rules in that spend our money right, hold our politicians, whether Democrat or Republican, accountable and stop this, we brought a grant to a not-for-profit and then allow that not-for-profit to fund their campaign. I will focus on that from D.C., and we will stop these donations from coming. Thank you. All right. Just... Question, right? Yes, questions. Yeah. Oh, sorry. State, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, it's all answer. coming up. Sorry. Um, so now we're going to open up for anyone have any questions for Mr. Pa uh, Sosa Paquette. Anything at all? Would you um, vote to get rid of the Patriot Act? Yes. Thank you. It's very dangerous. Question three. Yeah. Question three. I'm not in federal, so help me. No, okay. Yes or no? Um, Tell me what question three is. is the dental one. The no, dental no, one? No, no, that no, is. Liquor licenses. Liquor licenses. Liquor licenses. I don't want to expand them and stuff. I think our small businesses and stuff should be able to be just that okay. and stuff. Our corporations have already dominated us, so why would I do that? I'm a small business guy. I'm all about small businesses. We lost 44% of our small businesses. We need to restore it. Anyone have any more questions? I, I got a couple in just in okay. case. Um, what do you think you can do for our district as, so, as, uh, when you, if you get elected? My focus on our district is, <laughs> I look at Templeton, Orange, this whole part of the district, and it's what I call flyover country and stuff. We've taken care of the Amherst, Northampton, and we understand why. We've taken care of Worcester and the communities back this way. This whole part of the district has been ignored for decades. 
when you drive through and you see one closed factory after another, one decrepit building after another. Jim McGovern's been our congressman for 26 years. 66,000 veterans, 40,000 of them are in our district, don't have appropriate housing. We have a housing shortage. What are all of our elected officials doing, federal and state? Fix those buildings, reopen our middle class jobs, not Dunkin' Donut jobs. We need manufacturing jobs. And if we can't turn those buildings back into operating manufacturers, then rebuild them for affordable housing for our veterans, our seniors, and once we've taken care of those two categories, then we can look at anyone that needs affordable housing. But right now, our seniors are being taxed out of their homes. Our veterans don't even have appropriate housing. I have one question. Yeah. Federal money coming into the, to the, uh, our towns, how do you, like a lot of times money comes into the communities and towns and it's not used for what it's supposed to be used for. Because it's the rules. Remember, we have 11 Democrats that pass this money to Massachusetts and they write the rules. Jim McGovern is the chairman of the rules committee. He writes the rules that we all live under. It's as simple as that. I understand it's not him by himself. It's a committee. But it is his committee. So it goes. Biden, Pelosi, Jim. That's just the reality. So every one of us have to say, am I happy with the rules that I'm operating under? If you're not, you kind of got to get at least one Republican down in D.C. that's going to fight back against the rules that are written in. It's really that simple. So, in relation to that, do you advocate for term limits yes, I do. for most political positions? Yep. I believe in term limits. I was the first to be endorsed with it. And then I also have to be fair in disclosure. I work very much with the organization of term limits and was involved in with it before I was running for office. So, yes, I'm endorsed, but it's kind of disingenuous when I know my hands are in the background. <laughs> Um, I got another question. Um, what's your position on abortion? That's, abortion. A big, that's a hot topic these mm -hmm. days. And so, one, I don't believe abortion's on the ballot. I disagree. And so, I have been in front of tens of thousands of people, and it is not what they're talking to us about. And so, but where's my position on this? And I'm going to say it this way, and if you go to my website, it's as fair as we can be. I happen to be pro-life. I believe adoption saves lives. Both my children are adopted. Both my children were late-term abortions that were stopped. My daughter's abortion was stopped three days before she was born. She's 21 years old today. My son was born addicted to heroin. The mother was going to abort. Rylan is born. He's 11 years old. He spent the first three years of his life on breathing machines and different things like that. He's an amazing little boy. So, with that said, what is my responsibility as a legislator? My responsibility as a legislator is to put my personal beliefs aside and listen to our constituents, all constituents, not political party, all constituents. And what do our constituents want? Legal, safe, rare, and so. So I'm never going to take away someone's rights to an abortion, whether I agree with it or not. My job is to legislate that 75% of our citizens right here in Massachusetts want abortion with limits. That's where I'm at with it. So yes, you can say he's pro-life, but I'm not looking to strip anybody's rights away, nor at the end of the day, do you want me to legislate this from the federal side? Massachusetts has spoken. It's a state's rights issue. You want me to interfere at the federal side? You're going to roll back Massachusetts rights. Because then you're going to be in a situation where it's going to be 15 to 20 weeks. Or do we follow Europe? You know, all we hear from, really, a lot of our Democrats, right? Europe, Europe, Europe. We all got to do Europe. Okay, let's do Europe. It's 6 to 14 weeks. All of Europe. And so, so we have to just look and understand what are the limits Every politician, Democrat or Republican, must be able to stand and tell you what their limits are. Not, I, I support it. What's your limits? Because it's amazing how they don't want to answer. What's your limits? 
Are you willing to abort, let's say my daughter, three days before being born at nine months? Or is that a bridge too far? Every Democrat must answer it. Every Republican must answer it. Otherwise, they're disingenuous, and why would you vote for them? Good. Anyone else have any questions? Uh, oh, what are your limits? Hmm? What are your limits? My limits, if I have to legislate this, is going to be between 15 to 20 weeks. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, here's another one that's kind of hard. How, how do you think we can ensure election integrity? How do I ensure that we can do it? How do you One, think we can do it? And so I, <coughs> I think look at Pennsylvania, right? Pennsylvania's been voting for a month. Massachusetts early voting is getting underway and stuff. I don't know when elections turned into two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, two months. Are we out of our minds? Election day is election day. We need to pass a federal law that says election day is a holiday. You shut down. We go and we vote in person. And then we do mail-in ballots for those that cannot come and do it. The way we've always done it. What happened during COVID is insanity. And we all, and this notion when people say IDs, remember something. Every single person had to have an ID to get a COVID shot. So we have an ID. We can have an ID to vote. And those are the things we need to focus on. And we certainly need to bring elections back into at least the one week of election, not weeks. It, it, it's just, I'm 52 years old and I think it's insanity. Uh, anyone else have any more questions? And the last thing I'm on when I think about elections, the federal government has no right to interfere in election laws, period. It is a state's right. I'm a state's rights guy. You never want the federal government stepping in and telling Massachusetts and our legislators, we're taking your rights, we're going to speak for you. No, it's a state's issue. It belongs there. So any federal candidate <laughs> that's telling you we want to federalize our elections, kick them out on their, on their butts, Republican or Democrat. Keep the federal government out of it. We do not belong in it. Sorry. Oh, that's fine. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? I got uh, one more for you. Um, what, <laughs> what do you think um, you could actually do for our district? I know you talked about manufacturing and such, but... Jim has a question. Uh, I said, uh, he talked about manufacturing, but I'm asking him, what does he think and how does he think he can do it for our district to get us back on track? And Seth, it, it really is bring the right grant money, and I'm going to work with every state legislator, Republican or Democrat. So that is not where my focus is. For example, let's say, I'm going to just pick Ann because she's been our uh, rep for, what, 20 years? Correct. And Seth, my job is to work with her. And stuff, and I'm gonna say, and, and stuff, I'm focused on jobs and housing. I'm willing to fight for these grants for these things. She's gonna tell me where and which towns can we actually accomplish that at. And that's about making federal money actually work for what it's supposed to be. I wanna do a lot of bypassing the state, so to speak, and get right to the towns with an insistence. The money is for this. If you don't want it, don't take it. We'll move to the next community. There's no more of this, eh, we're going to say yes, and then we don't do it. And so that's the difference that you're going to have as me, as a federal representative, is I will hold D.C. accountable, but I will hold all my reps in my district, Republican or Democrat, accountable to the federal dollars that are coming. And I will be very vocal. I'm not a shy guy. I will be in front of the press all the time. I brought the money. Lorraine didn't want it. I moved to the next district. That's all. Okay. Uh, does anyone else have any more questions? All right. I guess we'll, uh, we're all set. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. You. Okay, we're going go uh, to go on to U.S. Senate. Which would be uh, state senate. I'm uh, sorry, state senate. senate. Yeah, sorry. You're giving me a, a <laughs> heart attack. Uh, <laughs> I hope well, not. Heart attack and a promotion. Yeah. That's all right. She's heading to DC. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, and and thanks. I don't think I don't think my opponents here either, um, but that's okay. Um, 
I'm always pleased to be in Templeton, and anytime I'm asked to come up, I come up, and even when I'm not asked, we come up, as John and I have been here quite a bit the last few weeks. I do want to say thanks to, to Terry, John, Steve, and everyone who took the time to come out this morning. It's a Saturday in the fall. It's a decent, nice day. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of places you probably could be, so I thank you for coming out here. And I, actually, I just want to talk about a few things that we've been able to do, and I, and I know, um, Steve, you, know, you, you mentioned um, you know, a few things on, on the federal level. Um, I can tell you that I'm very pleased with the partnership that I have with Jim McGovern, that I have um, with our federal partners, because a lot of the things that come in into the district and that benefit Templeton and benefit the region are because of the things that they have done. We're sitting in a building right now that my good friend Steve Brewer and I worked on to get some of the funding for. And you know, that's the type of ways that, that money is used on the state level level to practically um, this morning I was a little bit late getting here. I got here just before nine o'clock I have a 90 year old mother that I'm I'm very pleased to say that I can be with her every morning I go over to her house to do a few things to help her out and uh, she has a dog that's a little out of control and so I take the dog for a walk so she doesn't have to be out there walking the dog but I say that because when you look at a senior center, you look at the good things that happen here that Jackie and Cindy have been able to do. It's making sure that you know what's going on in your own community. You know, that's where things start. Things don't start at the state house. They start at your house. And what's important to you becomes important to us. And those are the things that we want to work on. And I just want to talk about a few things. Just this past week, in fact, I want to thank John um, and Paul, too, because they supported a bill that the governor signed into law for me when you were talking about um, adoption, it made me think about something that just was signed on uh, on this past week. There had been kind of a, a strange law in Massachusetts that people born before a certain date and after a certain date, they were born before that, they could have access to the original birth certificate. They were born after this date, they could have access. There were these people in this donut hole, basically in the 1970s and early 1990s, that did not have access to their original birth certificate. In order to get it, they would have to run through hoops, go to court, get a court order, go before a judge to get that, pay money. Made no sense. I've been working on this bill for almost 10 years. The governor signed it on Wednesday. And I had people that came in from all over the country. In fact, there was a woman that was born in Worcester. Um, she, she now works at uh, one of the medical schools, and I don't remember the name of it. She's in St. Louis. She flew from St. Louis to be here to see him sign that piece of paper. And she said to me, she said, you have my, made my life whole. Because she said, before when I would go to the Worcester City Clerk and they told me I couldn't have access to a, my original birth certificate, I did not feel like a person. Those are the type of things that we work on on the state level that, I, that I've been great to partner with John Zlotnick with, to partner with people like Jim McGovern, to partner with Paul DiPaolo, to partner with those people that realize that the things that we can work on make a difference in people's lives. You may not see it in the paper. You may not see a big flashy ad on it. No money associated with it, but it's the right thing to do. Uh, when you were talking about dog parks and walking trails, you just have to go down the street down here and see how well used that walking trail has been down in Baldwinville for an area that did not have a place for people to go. That extremely important. And I'm very pleased about the money that was used correctly from those APA funds because you've got people on this select board, you have a town administrator that knows how to use those funds correctly and that did not squander them and use them the right way. So I'm not sure who you're talking about, but it's not in Templeton. In the, in the elementary school building that we have, a new school building that's built here, one of the reasons that you see the population going up in Templeton is because of that school. When I talk to realtors, the first thing that they say when people are looking to move into an area, what's your school district like? The Narragansett School District is A number one, and that elementary school is bringing more people in. And it's a gorgeous building. There's no question. And you know what? Yeah, that was done from taxes. We, we made sure, and it was a difficult vote for me many years ago, to add another cent on the sales tax. So that sales tax, that one cent, could go to building schools. And that's why Templeton has a new school, because of what the people in this community decided to do. They opened up their wallets, and the state opened up their wallet to make sure that a new school was built. That's the partnerships that we want. Those are the partnerships that I'm extremely happy to, to be involved in. This past year, in fact, at the end of August, another one that John Zlotnick and Susie Whips helped extreme, it's, did a yeoman's work on. If you go up to the Templeton Developmental Center, many people have lived here for a long time, still call it the Fernald School property, right? Um, years ago, when the state was making some changes and how the, the, that folks with developmental disabilities and where they would live and not live, 
We made sure, and working at, at that time, as a rep at that time with Steve Brewer as your state senator, we made sure that land was put into it, it, to be held until it could not be used for any other purposes, not for development. There were some tracks that hadn't been put under that, and this past year, with John's help, we made sure in working with your town and with a fellow that you probably know, Ron Amadon, who's the Commissioner for Fish and Wildlife, we now have land that is saved up at the Templeton area that is for fish and wildlife so that people who want to hunt and fish and trap, that it's open to all of that. Another section with working with MDAR, the Department of Agricultural Resources, to make sure that that land will stay open for agricultural production. Those are the things that we do on the state level. That's what we do every day. Again, a lot of it doesn't splashy, but it's the right use of public dollars. It's the right use of state dollars. It's the right use of federal dollars. And as your Could state you senator, I will absolutely wrap it up. I'm happy to continue to working. It's been my absolute pleasure to serve this community. It's a community I love that I'll continue to work for. And uh, I know that you see me a lot. I think this is my third time this week. So um, good or bad, I'm here. Thank you, Judge. Yeah. Uh, do you have any questions for Ms. Goby? Yes, Jeff. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, uh, regarding when the state opens their checkbook, yes, sir. They are handing us back our tax Correct. dollars. It's not printed. It's not magic formula or anything like that. So you tax us more, and then you give the money back to us, and we, somehow we were received a favor. My question. Uh, for you is question one, yes, which says it's going to increase tax on a certain group, and it's going to give money back to improve education and colleges and roads and bridges. No mention of the electric grid, but uh, it has that magic three words in it, subject to appropriation. So part A is, do you support question one? And number two is, how can we be guaranteed that all of that money is going to go for what is advertised, because I recall uh, Chapter 70 funding regional school districts, the state will pay for 100% of regional school district transportation, except subject to appropriation, and we know it doesn't get funded 100%. So if I vote for question one, yes, how do I know all that money is going to come back? Because yeah. if you all only appropriate 50% of it, the rest of it's sitting there, in my eyes, like a slush fund to be used on something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so can I, can I answer you the questions in kind of reverse since you started with the regional, ended with the regional school transportation for, before it comes out of my mind? And that's something we've talked a lot about, right, Jeff, over, over the years. Uh, I, I serve as uh, the, the co-chair for the Regional Schools Caucus. John is a, a very vocal member of, of that caucus. And in fact, a couple days ago, my good friend, uh, Representative Kim Ferguson, who is a Republican from Holden, she and I both received an award from the Mass Association of Regional Schools because of our work specifically on that issue. And you're right, back in the late 1950s, when they were going to regionalize schools, the carrot was to get people to want to regionalize because nobody wanted to do it. And Wachusett was the first district in the state to regionalize, the, the, the oldest regional school district in the state of Massachusetts. That carrot was you'll get 100% regional school transportation. And it has never been funded 100%. And you're right, those, those words, those three words, subject to appropriation, one thing I can tell you, Jeff, that regardless if those words are there, everything in the budget is subject to appropriation. If you don't have the money, it can't appropriate. So that, that language is in there, but it doesn't really need to be. Uh, and we'll continue to fight. This year, with John's help, we, we were able to get regional school transportation funding up to 85%. It's the highest it's ever been. And we're going to continue that fight, and that's something that I'm very proud of, and we'll continue to work with my good friends on both sides of the aisle, which I think, but, and I just want to mention, too, I think I'm probably, along with John, um, two of the most bipartisan legislators there are, and I think it could be one reason uh, that no one in the state Senate, regardless of party, has come out to support my opponent. In fact, no one in the, uh, on the House side either. So anyway, um, to get to question one. Um, I am voting yes on question one, and, your, and some of your concerns are my concerns, because I'll tell you what my concern is. It is going to be, it would change the state constitution. So in the state constitution, it would say, for public education, public higher education, and repair and maintenance, not new, not new infrastructure, repair and maintenance of existing infrastructure, Okay. My concern is that I want to make sure that those are going to be extra funds, that it's not going to supplant 
the work that we've done on, on education, like the Student Opportunity Act. So I have concerns, too. I'm not going to tell you that I don't. I have some concerns with it. Um, so that's the answer. Obviously, everybody has the same right I do on the ballot box on that day. You either vote yes or you vote no. And what happens, happens with it. So if you have concerns about yes. it, why would you vote yes? Please? Well, because I think my concerns, because I think the good that will come out of it outweigh my concerns. That's my personal opinion. Yours may be different. You can't undo it, though. So vote no until it's better. That's all I ask. Well, but, but what's the better, I guess, would be my question back to you. Yeah. Well, again, you know, this was this was written, this was a uh, initiative petition. We have a, a state that allows initiative petitions, free free petition in Massachusetts. So, mm. yes. Did you say that it changes the state constitution? It would, right? Because in our constitution, it, we have a flat five percent income tax rate, and so what this would change is that anyone that that has income over a million dollars. So that first million would still be taxed at that the 5% rate. Above would be an additional 4%. So above the million dollars would be a 9%. Now, to change the state constitution, don't you need a, like a really big majority vote? Yes, it went through. It had to go through many cycles of the legislature. It had to go through two consecutive, and then people had to go out and get, and, uh, get signatures on ballots. Excuse me, on the uh, petitions. Yeah, it was a very lengthy process. More than four years. Uh, but is it like years? A little three quarters years. of the state has to vote for that to change that? Well, oh, oh, yeah. Well, that, you're going to the ballot box. Okay. So uh, it'll be on the ballot. Right. It can't so, just win 51 to 40. Well, no, it could. Correct. And change the constitution. Correct. The state, the state constitution. Correct. Yep. A majority that vote. That sounds funny. Yeah. Well, that's the... That is the... Just that is another the, comment on the, the, the small farms. Yes. In order to... Just maintain any kind of retirement. They're going to have to start selling off pieces in order to stay under that million dollar. And you're going to see small farms just evaporate. So um, I, I have, I used to chair the Environment, Natural Resources, and Agriculture Committee. I worked very closely with farmers. I mean, you can talk to Matt Leclerc down the street and see some of the, the work that we've done for, with MDAR to support him. But um, it, it's income. It's income. So it's total income. So even like that, that gentleman that, if you watch that um, ad that's on TV, um, he's a cranberry farmer from Howitch, right? And he was interviewed, and I don't remember, I, I apologize, I don't know if it's WBUR, but it, you can go back and you can kind of look it up. And even in the interview that he gives, he, he just says, hey, look it, if I were to sell everything at one time, I would be over that million dollars and I would be taxed on that for that, for that one time. And so that's not a lie. I don't know how many people, to be honest with you, that if they have that kind of money, I mean, I don't have that kind of money, but if people have that kind of money, right, no, if they did, right, if it, the, the, that they wouldn't be talking to a tax attorney to... The city of Gardner is planning a, a large sludge landfill expansion in West Gardner that is very close to the Templeton border. Uh, this expansion, if done next year, could be as early as next year, is within one mile of two of Templeton's public water wells, Sawyer Street and the Otter River Well. It's within 1,300 feet of the Otter River. My question is, uh, what state and federal grant programs can be brought into play here to provide some funding so that Gardner can come up with a green solution, which other communities are doing across the state and the country, a green solution to wastewater sludge disposal rather than expanding the sludge landfill in West Gardner. So well, I'm really interested in what can be done to help Gardner yeah. because we really need something here. So the, um, the through the Municipal Vulnerability Planning Grants, uh, in, in fact, you know, Templeton's part of that and, and I I'm assuming, and I apologize, I don't know, I would assume that Gardner also is part of that MVP program, and there are grants available for that, for the kind of thing that you're, you're talking about. Um, I don't know specifically what the alternative would be. I know that you mentioned some other in, 
yeah, you said an alternative. Alter- I wasn't sure what you had alternative. Yeah, green alternatives like anaerobic digestion. I got you. Okay, yeah. So, composting, yep, yep, yep. those other things. So anaerobic digesters, uh, there is actually a, a very good program in Massachusetts run through the Department of Agriculture. In fact, one of the largest anaerobic digesters is on Jordan's Farm in Rutland, uh, where they are taking a lot of that, though, is food waste. They're not using sludge specifically. They are using some of the carbonor in there. Um, so I don't know if that's necessarily set up to take sludge. So I, uh, But there are anaerobic digesters. Um, available. There is funding for anaerobic digesters, and I imagine if there were anaerobic digesters that did accept sludge specifically, I, I think that that's a doable option. Yeah, I'm thinking of something like Deer Island. Oh, it's okay. Much smaller scale. Yeah, yeah. What Deer Island does near Winthrop, Mass. Right. Is it um, takes wastewater sludge from all around Boston, converts it to energy to generate electricity, and what remains in digest state is converted to fertilizer. Yeah. So, and so that, that's one, that's just one example. That's a very yeah. large. Scale. That's a that's a big that's a large one, and, and um, the MWRA runs that, the Water Resources Authority. And of course, I always like to to talk about the MWRA because, of course, they get their water from Quabbin Reservoir. Um, that that uh, you know, four towns, Dana, Enfield, Greenwich, and Prescott, no longer exist. So that Boston and some eighty something other communities could get their water. And by the way, I do, and not to get too off track, but I do try to remind people about that when we're at the state house when they turn on the tap to make sure that they know that water came from my district. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. we the people all across Massachusetts are hurting financially. Okay. Um, I've heard about taxing and taking more money from the people. What is your uh, position on the trillions of dollars that were, we were taxed over what was needed that is available to the people, and how would you get that money back to the people? So I'm not sure exactly the, the trillions that you're talking about specifically. However, um, as I mentioned, some of the, some of the grants and the funding that we do already in the state, as I mentioned a couple examples, with the land preservation that we have at the Templeton Developmental well, Center. That's, that's and doing pro- programs. I'm talking, how do you help the individual people in your state uh, benefit for the, this overtaxed money? How do you get that overtaxed money back to people? It seems like you don't even know that there's this $3 trillion no, no, no. that's so, supposed to be going back to the um, part of it, you're going to get a check in November. If you paid into the, the tax system, the 62F um, legislation that had been signed back in, like, 1986, and if Massachusetts, if we hit certain benchmarks, which we did this year, that money is going back. And um, so you'll get a check. Every person who filed uh, taxes, regardless, um, it, wherever you are, if you're a multimillionaire or on the lower end of the scale, you're all getting a check back, and it's coming so back when, in November. When is that going to happen? November. November. Yeah, yeah. It's supposed to be by the end of November. The, um, the there's work being done for the governor's office and administration finance office, and they're just working on the rest of the details. But yeah, um, we were told from when I say we the legislature, we were told from the governor's office that that would happen by the end of November. Yeah. And one other question: I know excise tax has always been a thorn in my side for me parking my vehicle in my driveway. I have to pay an excise tax every year. Okay. Uh, is there any way that that excise tax could be eliminated? So the excise tax stays with the communities, and so I think that would be a big conversation to have with the Mass Municipal Association and your local officials because that stays in the community. Okay. Uh, so could the uh, state government kind of, that money that would be going back into the community, could the, the state government um uh, take the place of that money and bring that money, the same amount, back into the community? Well, I suppose you could. You'd have to find out a f- uh, funding stream to do it. Kind of on that same point, uh, last year, um, those of you who may have a fishing or hunting license, we give free licenses to people after they hit a certain age, which we should do. And um, But Fisheries and Wildlife had called me up, and I got a call and said, you know, this is putting us almost a million dollars a year. We're, we're, we're losing money. So I put money in the it, to to change language in the state budget to say, hey, look, it it's the right thing to do to give free hunting and fishing licenses. So the the, the state government should do that. So it's not it's been done before that the state will replenish things that make sense because that obviously makes sense to do that, and I was proud to do that. All right, thank you, Greg. 
Oh, I just wanted to say that I love what you did for the um, Fernal School up the street and the other things that have been done to help the town of Templeton. Thank you, I appreciate um, it. But I also, I also was very concerned about what he said uh, about the 1,300 feet within the boundary of the um, Otter River because the protection of the water resources are um, critical for people drinking clean water. I'm just wondering um, what your thoughts are about environment protection. Yeah, so uh, on that particular issue, and I don't want to put, you know, I know Adams, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, Adam, or the, the select board members that are here, but maybe that could be a conversation. Maybe we need to sit down with the folks from Gardner and, and talk about, um, you know, what is actually happening with that project and to see what, what we can do with DEP with it. That, that's what I would say. I don't want to um, usurp the, the position of, uh, you know, you have a town administrator and you have a select board that makes those decisions. I don't want to take that away from them. All right, so up next we have a uh, House of Rep and Mr. John Vladek. So when I started out, I used to always have to follow uh, Steve Brewer, who I'm sure some of you have heard and I always thought was a very good order. Uh, and now I have to follow Ann Gobi a lot of times, uh, and I'm jealous of both of them. Um, I think I could do public speaking for the rest of my life, and I would never be as comfortable um, or as free-flowing as they are up here. Um, so, uh, hello and good morning. Uh, my name is John Zlotnick, and I'm happy to be appearing on Templeton's ballot for the first time this year. I was born and raised in Gardner. I graduated from Gardner High in 2008 and UMass Lowell in 2012 with a degree in history. My mother was a teacher and used to teach at Templeton Center. My dad, a retired electrician, is from Otter River, so I'm excited for the chance to represent Templeton, which very much was a second home to me when I was a kid. I've been a member of the House of Representatives for 10 years. In that time, I've prioritized education and infrastructure investments. I think the communities I represent have good plans and a good idea of how they want to grow and where their strengths are. The missing component usually is capital, the money to get that going. That's the role I think the state should play, and I think that's an important part of my job, is steering those state investments to support those local efforts in my district. Whether it's housing or business development, supporting infrastructure I have found is key. Water, sewer connections, capacity, uh, connecting roads can make the difference whether a development goes forward or not, and I'm proud to say that last year my district received the largest state infrastructure grant. That's the key to how I see my job and my role and what I do for all of you. I've always prioritized working with local officials, local department heads, and local nonprofits. I think your legislator should support the good work already being done on the ground, and I really believe that when state and local offices coordinate, communicate, and collaborate, we can accomplish more for our constituents. That's what my job should be, whether it's policies or funding, to make sure the municipalities in my district get what they need from the state. I've put an emphasis on bipartisanship. I have a reputation for working across the aisle and building consensus. Almost every one of my bills and amendments have bipartisan co-sponsors, and I have one of the most bipartisan voting records of any member in the House. I support reasonable solutions regardless of which political party puts them forward. I will add to that during my time in the House, I think it has been an era of productive bipartisan cooperation. For example, of the 10 annual budgets I have voted on, nine were passed with near unanimous bipartisan support. In fact, many of the pieces of legislation pass with that level of broad support. That's because of members like myself who insist on approaching our problems by taking in diverse political opinions and finding solutions based on reality, not an ideology. Bottom line, I think government works best when it works for everybody. I was part of the committee that rewrote the 30-year-old state funding formula for local aid for public schools. These changes reflect the real costs of education, and over the course of implementing that bill, it will direct more than a billion more dollars per year from the state government uh, to local governments to support public schools. I've also supported first responders in law enforcement. You don't have to take my word for it. They have endorsed me through MassCOP, the Massachusetts Coalition of Police, and the New England Police Benevolent Association, as well as Makufu, who represents corrections officers. To support first responders, I've led an effort to put state funds into on-site academy in Westminster. That's a nonprofit that treats post-traumatic stress 
and incident-related stress for firefighters, police, EMS, and corrections officers. Through funding I've secured for them, hundreds of individuals have been able to go there to get the help they need and deserve at no cost to the communities they work for. I support the Second Amendment. I'm a member of the Sportsman's Caucus, and you don't have to take my word for it. I've been endorsed by the Gun Owners Action League. I will... I also want to share one thing that I think is, is something I've always tried to do and I think gives you a, a window into how I approach my work. Um, we'll be announcing soon, but I've been working on for many months, a regional collaboration regarding uh, the opioid settlement that you may have seen about or read about. Uh, earlier this year, it was announced that Massachusetts uh, and a number of other states concluded um, a lawsuit against a number of the opioid manufacturers and distributors uh, to um, you know, pay for the damage that they've caused uh, to so many individuals in our community. Um, I was excited by the number, um, but then when you break that out to all the states that are receiving money, and then further to the individual communities that are receiving money, that number gets really small really quick. And I looked at the numbers for this region, and specifically my district, and I saw that some communities were only receiving a few thousand dollars a year. So I started out trying to uh, group these communities together to try and make a bigger impact, and I'm proud to say um, we've been successful in getting communities to be involved. Templeton just voted to be a part of it last week at their selectmen's meeting, uh, and we're hoping to bring other, a couple more communities uh, into that effort to make a bigger punch by combining those funds. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming here today and those of you watching on TV, and I'm happy to take questions. How would we know what your policies are? So, um, one, uh, I've been in this position for 10 years. In that time, I've done uh, numerous televised interviews, numerous radio interviews, numerous print interviews. I put information out on my social media. Um, you're correct that my johnslotnick.com page is a campaign page, um, but there is information about the policies I support on the State House page, the bills I file, the votes I've taken. Um, and yeah, someone in the back. Hi, um, you mentioned the uh, regional collaborative for the opioid settlement mm. money. What is the regional collaborative going to do with that money? Do you know at this point? Yes. So, like I said, most of the communities out here really aren't getting that much money, with the exception of of Gardner being the biggest population center. Obviously, these things are doled up by formula. Uh, population tends to be a big factor in that. Um, and so Gardner is getting the biggest chunk of money, Winchenden uh, not far behind that. So what we are proposing to do with these funds, um, because they do have to be spent um, on recovery and addiction services, uh, is we are proposing that we create a position called uh, Recovery Support Navigator. Uh, that person will coordinate with local police and fire departments uh, to uh, respond either in the aftermath of an overdose or if, um, you know, if there's an awareness that someone uh, needs help. Uh, the reason that I think this is important and effective use of these funds um, is that, you know, in my experience working on this issue over the years, uh, timing is everything. The quicker you can get to someone after that incident, uh, the more likely you are to get them into, into, some, kind of into some kind of treatment program. Um, and, um, and, and hopefully into long-term recovery. Um, right now, there are some programs that offer uh, similar services in our area, but because they're um, either part-time or largely volunteer, sometimes there can be um, quite a wait uh, from point to point. Um, and that's the thing I'm trying to cut down with this. The other piece to this, too, is that um, this would be a clinical, a clinical level position um, which I think will help because um, there's obviously a, addiction treatment isn't a one size fits all. It's very complex, and I think by having someone who is uh, a real specialist in the field, so to speak, um, that we can uh, really make those those pairings. I think a lot better. Um, so that's what that's what we're planning on doing on the with the money, uh, at least to start. Um, Hopefully, my hope is that if this program is success, uh, successful, um, that it will run the entire length of the settlement, which I think is uh, over the next two decades. Yeah, my question is about um, question four on the ballot. And my understanding, and you can 
correct me if I'm wrong, the uh, bill to allow illegal aliens to get driver's licenses goes into effect next uh, July unless it is repealed. <coughs> and my understanding is that all of the Democrats voted for this and went to this governor who vetoed it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, and came back and was passed. Um, so I just want to know what your position yeah. on that is and why. So, um, so not every Democrat voted for it, and I did vote for it this time, but this is something that I've opposed in the past, and I think explaining why I changed my mind, I think, will give you an insight into, I think, what's changed with the bill and how I see this issue. Um, so this, this bill already existed when I joined the legislature, and like I said, for, for many years I opposed it because I thought that um, it... Uh, it delved too much into an immigration issue that I felt was uh, appropriately a federal jurisdiction. Um, sometimes we're 50 states, sometimes we're one country, uh, and on immigration I think it's important to be one country. Um, however, uh, in that time, and really even before my time in the legislature, um, both parties have, at the federal level, expressed uh, a need and desire and a realization that the immigration system needs to be fixed, uh, that there are problems with it that haven't been addressed. Um, in that time, uh, both major political parties have had complete control of the federal government at least once, uh, sometimes uh, multiple occasions uh, over, that, over that stretch of time. And while they've been able to get other things done that were uh, priorities for them, uh, they didn't touch this. Uh, I think there were some people who earnestly tried, um, but nothing was done with it. And um, that left the states, I think, holding the bag on this issue. Um, because individual states don't have the power to deport an individual. Um, uh, for example, like we just saw with the, um, the governor of Florida uh, sending people to Massachusetts, I'm sure he would have rather sent them uh, out of the country. Um, but he had to send them to Massachusetts because an individual state and governor doesn't have that uh, power and authority. So I look at it like we're, as, an, as a state and individual communities, are left uh, holding the bag, as I said, um, on this issue. That means that it taxes uh, local resources, whether it be police fire departments have to uh, deal with these situations of, of unlicensed drivers. Um, it's Drivers who don't have proper training, don't have the uh, testing that we all went to to make sure that we know the rules of the road, aren't verified that they're driving registered cars, aren't verified that they have appropriate insurance, like everybody else on the road. So, for one, I think it's a good thing that if people are going to be driving on the road, which, like I said, even though I don't like it, I think we're stuck with the situation, that those people... Uh, have to go through the road test, have to go through the written test, have to apply for a license and get it. Um, I think those are good things from a public safety standpoint. Um, I will say the other thing, and, and one, of my big, one of my big reluctances in the past, and I'll say a big part of the reason I opposed this in the past, um, was that I was concerned about um, our ability to verify documents that would be presented to verify someone's uh, identification who was applying for a license. Um, one of the compromises that got made in the bill that was eventually passed um, was it, it stipulates that to be able to apply and qualify for one of these uh, licenses, you need to present a valid unexpired passport. Uh, and that was a big deal for me. That was a big change uh, from what was uh, before. Um, the way it was before, well, you could show a passport, but you could show kind of a laundry list of other uh, um, uh, documents. Um, but making sure that a valid unexpired passport was uh, one of the documents um, I thought changed things for me because um, on the one hand, if you show up at the airport uh, with a valid unexpired passport from a country whom we recognize and, and with whom we have diplomatic relations, uh, you'll get a visa um, because we are confident in that document. The federal government, the Department of State, the Department of Homeland Security uh, is confident in that document. Um, and so with that change, I'll still say that I, um, I'm not a fan 
Um, but I think under the circumstances, I try to be pragmatic and realistic. And I think with those changes and given the circumstances, and I think the fact that, again, uh, we waited about as long as we could for the federal government to fix this problem, that I reluctantly supported the solution at the state level. Yeah, I have a question. <clears throat> yeah, as, as a Christian in, in your district, I, I believe that uh, life begins at conception. That's my personal belief, okay? And like Jeffrey Sosa Paquette says, the, the um, issue of abortion is going to be a state issue. And I'm just curious, as you're my, my rep, is what's your stand on it and what is your limit on, on abortion? Um, so I'm, I'm pro-choice. I support the status quo uh, uh, in Massachusetts. Um, and also, I don't understand status quo. Oh, okay. I'll get to that. Um, but I'll say, and I think this will probably answer a number of questions the way I'm going to answer this, um, but I, I hold a high premium um, on, on individual liberty and the government getting out of your life. Um, it's what's led a lot of votes that I think um, you would not expect uh, from most Democrats. Um, I voted against the menthol cigarette ban, for instance, because I felt that that was, um, someone used the phrase, a bridge too far in terms of how much, uh, uh, how much we're willing to cede that authority to the government and how much we're uh, willing to allow the government to dictate uh, personal decisions. Excuse um, me, I, the time is getting, getting what? I just want to know what your stands and what your limits on abortion. I don't all yes. this other stuff yes. so, on that particular issue because the time is passing quickly. Okay. Um, so I think the best way I can answer that is to say that I think it's a, a personal, private decision. I can't think of a more personal or private decision than the decision to uh, start a family. Um, and so I don't think that the government or myself or my fellow reps or senators should have any say. I oh, think that's do. a... You do. Okay. Well, that... You do. I, I just want you're not giving me your limits on what you believe about abortion. And you just want you just want to know how many weeks. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. So, well, so I'll, I'll start. I'll start by saying what what the law is uh, in Massachusetts and what I support is. And like I said, I support the status quo. Um, and uh, that is. Um, um, thank you. Um, with the, uh, what we call, uh, with, I shouldn't say what we call, what the medical community calls uh, the fatal fetal anomaly uh, exception, which I think um, is important, and I think we saw a lot of, uh, a lot of cases in the last few years that um, show why that exemption is important, and so that's, that's what I support for Massachusetts. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Representative Zlotnick, uh, welcome to our community. My name is Rick Payne. I'm a lifelong resident of this town, and I have the honor of serving as the Deputy Fire Chief for this community. And I, first of all, I want to say this community is very supportive of public safety. Um, Senator Brewer, has, uh, Senator Hickovy, sorry, Ann, has been very supportive. You're new to us. You're helping us out as well. Um, there's a lot of grants that we take advantage of. But one, one area that we suffer with, as well as area communities, Winchin's going through it right now, Gardner's not far behind. Our fire stations are outdated. They don't have the living uh, quarters that are required for the full-time staff, the 24-hour staff, male, female, that type of thing. What do you see in the future? What funds are out there, and what can you do to help these communities? Because it's going to hit every one of us. Yeah, so um, I, I agree that it's a problem. And, and, and like you said, um, uh, Winchenden has it on the ballot at the next town meeting. Um, Gardner is not, like you said, far behind in, in having to replace their station. Um, and in my time in the House... Just about every part of my district has had to rebuild or make significant renovations to their police stations as well. Um, as things stand currently, it is very difficult to get state money in a significant dollar amount for municipal buildings, whether they be public safety or general governmental buildings. Um, so that's the status quo. Um, there's, I think, somewhere between seven or eight different bills that make uh, kind of the same proposal, tweaking a little bit, that I support. Um, uh, I can't remember who mentioned the MSBA, um, but that's the Mass School Building Authority. Um, and what they do is they help build schools. And I think they've done um, a tremendous job with that. And they've, uh, we build schools more efficiently, more cost effective. There's less cost overruns um, since the MSBA uh, was put into place. 
Um, and what these bills propose doing, uh, and what I support doing, um, is creating basically like a companion piece to that uh, for not just public safety buildings and municipalities, but municipal, uh, municipal buildings uh, generally. Um, the costs are almost always prohibitive uh, for especially small and rural communities to have the facilities that they need um, for these things. Um, plus, I'll say that as, um, you know, in, in the... In the specific case of Templeton, uh, I've been at the station, there's a lot of problems with it. Um, not the least of which is that the trucks are housed in a different physical structure uh, from where the, the crew quarters are. Um, so middle of winter, inclement weather, what have you, um, Templeton firefighters have to uh, leave this building, go downstairs, go through a passageway, uh, go back to a separate building where the garage is. That's issue number one. Um, issue number two is, that whether it's police, fire, EMS, uh, the equipment that they need and that they use on a regular basis to save our lives, to uh, help in all manner of situations, is extremely expensive. And it's expensive to replace. Um, and, you know, credit to the federal government, they've taken a bigger step in buying fire apparatus in recent years. But if we don't have an adequate place to store it and shield it from uh, the weather and make sure that there's space for appropriate um, maintenance work to be done, um, you know, those investments don't last nearly as long as we need to. So I think this is important, uh, and I support those bills. Um, I will say that the trade-off, just like with the MSBA, is that there's always a trade-off when the state gets involved in funding something uh, between, between local and state control. And it's the same thing when the federal government gets involved in funding something. Um, but I think we've struck that right balance um, with the MSBA, and I think we can create a program uh, like this as well. The last thing I'll mention on the firefighters thing, because I think this is important. Um, we have seen a tremendous uptick in, in the rates of certain cancers among firefighters. Um, we know that that's because they're exposed to a ton of different chemical compounds that we know cause cancer um, as a routine part of their job, whether it's uh, the stuff that's burning that they're trying to put out, um, whether it's the... Um, chemicals that they're using to put out uh, that fire um, and you know a modern fire station needs apparatus to make sure that the equipment can be cleaned to make sure that their turnout gear can be cleaned uh, that there's appropriate space for all that or that even even some older stations still don't have appropriate exhaust for the diesel fumes that come out of the trucks that then firefighters have to breathe so all those things I think are important and and that's why I support those bills and I think the state has a bigger role to play there we have, Justice, how much time we got left? All right. I, I, the woman in the fan jacket, did you have a question? No, you didn't? Okay. So, are we... Do you have a quick question? Well, she had a question, and aren't you with him? Yeah. Go ahead first. Please. To follow up on the building municipal buildings, mm. is it, aren't they so expensive because the state has so many regulations regarding... Can't they back off on some of those regulations so it's not... So expensive. Yes, and, and um, the longer I talk, the longer you'll hear me keep using the word balance, right? Because I think that's the most important thing uh, that, that government does, is, is tries to find appropriate balance, right? So when it comes to uh, building codes and building standards, obviously you have to, you have to balance the, uh, the need for structural integrity and safety and also the balance of cost. And so um, I can say, sure, I think the state goes overboard, um, in some of those requirements, um, because I think they put uh, too much of a one-size-fits-all approach uh, to some of these projects that I don't think um, I, I don't think have the benefit that um, um, I, I don't think they, I, I don't think the money makes the benefit. I guess is is, is the point of it. Um, you know, and I'll say that the other thing too is obviously what drives up the cost of um, public projects is prevailing wage. Um, which I support the concept of prevailing wage. I think it's necessary to make sure that we're getting uh, quality work done for public projects, spending public dollars. Um, but I think there's I think there's room for reform because I think especially in a state like Massachusetts that is one of the most unequal states economically in the country uh, in terms of wealth, right? Um, that those of us in rural and less affluent communities end up paying those premiums kind of on behalf of, of the more wealthy eastern parts of the state. Like I said, I think, I think there's, um, I think there's, in, in this, sorry, to answer your whole question, 
Um, yes, I think that the state goes overboard in some of these things. It drives up those costs. Um, but I do think that some of that is also necessary to make sure that things are being done well. Uh, last question. Yeah, you spoke, you spoke a little while ago about liberty. Yeah. What is your um, stance on vaccine mandates? Um, I'm not going to second guess everything that the governor did to get us through COVID. I'll say that the only time that the legislature took a role in it was for ourselves, and I did support the mandate on members of the House. So when you talk about it's an individual's right to choose only in certain instances, is that the well, way I read liberty in, in your state? Well, you I'm going to... I'm going to... I believe in liberty, but... I'm going to use the... I'm going to use the word balance again, and... Um, some of this is with the benefit of hindsight, but I think that some of the things that was done through the, you know, through the, the governor's mandate, I think there could have been more flexibility. I think there could have been more room for exemptions. Um, but in general, um, uh, I think, I think, again, in general, in that balance between the need for public health and, and my belief in personal liberty, yeah, it's, it's here. It's not here, but I, I support... Um, I, I think I'm, I'm not opposed to the mandate. I think that's the fairest way I can say that. Can I ask a follow-up on no, that? I, we, we gotta we gotta move on here. We're way past time. The pharmaceutical okay. industry. Yeah, but we're way past time. Maybe Mr. Zalotnik will answer your question later. I'm, I'm happy to. He'll be he'll be I'm hanging around, and he'll ask you later. Um, Mr. Bruce Chester, you. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Good. Good morning. My name is Bruce Chester. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm a resident of Gardner and have been for the past five plus years. Um, people will ask me, why did I run? Simple. People aren't talking to each other. Okay? I'm, I'm direct and sometimes I'm a little blunt, so I'm nice. Okay? <laughs> what do I stand for? Well, let me put it this way. I spent 20 years of my life serving this country in the United States Army National Guard. I retired as a captain and I did uh, a tour of duty in Iraq. So let me ask you a question. How many have you lived in an environment where there were, there were no police at all? Typically, that's normal, okay? We have another person, now they're probably another veteran that went off to war, okay? I am pro-police. I am pro-life. I am pro-individual liberty, okay? You are what's most important to me. As I run, your voice is what needs to be heard, not mine. I can talk. Those of you, some of you know me, I can talk, and I can talk a long time. But what's been most valuable to me in this second time running is being able to listen. Why? Because nothing is more important to me than what's important to you. Okay? I'm, I'm a... I'm not small enough to call myself a scrapper, but I don't pull any punches, okay? I'm nice, but um, I'm like a dog with a bone, okay? I don't believe in the status quo. I think the status quo is crap, okay? Can I say crap? You just did. <laughs> okay? I also have a, a, a pretty wide sense of humor, okay? Things need to change, okay? While I understand the need for balance, and I'm a big advocate of balance, okay, the status quo isn't working, okay? Some of you, especially if you're business owners, are suffering. I'm going to put a stop to that, okay? Some of you business owners, uh, excuse me, homeowners, okay? Your taxes are going out of control. I'm going to fight that, okay? But we, I can't, A, I can't do it alone. So one of my main platforms is not only government accountability, but government transparency, I'm going to take a couple minutes a minute or so to explain both. Government transparency, you are required by law to pay taxes, right? Don't you have a right to know how that money is being spent? I don't have any compunction about walking into the mayor's office and saying, hey, mayor, what are you doing for me today? I've done it. Don't ask, don't believe me? Go ask Dean Mazzarello, my minister. Well, he may not remember. It's been a while. Okay. I don't have any compunction about doing that as a citizen, Okay. You have that same right. And if, if that person, whoever they may be, town selectman, town manager, can't take two minutes to say, you know what, I either am uh, kind of in the middle of something, can I get with you later, or give you an answer, you need to rethink about 
having that person be your town manager, mayor, or, or board of selectmen member, okay? They work for you. I work for you once I get elected, okay? That's how it has to be, okay? Do things cost money? Of course they do. We're all adults. We know that, okay? The question is, is the money being spent correctly, okay? I'm going to hold off telling you my... Uh, my opinions on some of the ballot questions. I'll let you guys ask those questions. But once I get into office, it's going to be a whole new ball of wax. Okay, there's not going to be any sneaky pants or games. There's not going to be any be any backdoor deals. Okay, why am I saying that? Oh my God, you said backdoor deals. Yeah, I said backdoor deals. You know why? Because I talk. People tell me these things. I don't come up with this stuff. I'm not that clever. Okay, it's going to be honest. It's going to be transparent. In if I will have my office, okay, will have either a technological way of getting back to you when you call my office, or somebody, or even myself, will pick up the phone and say, what can I do for you, okay? On my door knockers is my phone number. It's this phone right here. You're talking to me, okay? Why? I work for you. You have a right to know what your state representative is up to at any given time. Okay, not three in the morning because we're asleep, but other than that, that's what we're here for. You put us here. Okay, once again, we need to listen to you. Okay, <coughs> and that's, I'm going to stop there for my opening. Uh, I'm going to let you guys ask questions. Perfect. Do we have any questions? Yes, ma'am, in the back. I'd like to know what your priorities are for change, the status, changing the status quo for our area? I'm going to start with economic development. Okay, If people are insecure about whether they're a business owner or whether they've got jobs, okay, the government has a direct effect on how well or uh, how those businesses operate in a, given, in a given area. So one of my top priorities is to create legislation and interact with uh, local business owners and local economic groups to be able to say, what can we do to make it easier for you to do business in the district? That, it starts there. Okay. Once we do that, it's going to be an invitation for other businesses to come out. I'm, I'm from Gardner. Gardner, for, for decades, I, I travel all over in the state. I say I'm from Gardner. Oh, do they still have uh, furniture companies up there? Yeah. Okay. That's what that's known for. Okay. And there's no reason why the entire district can't take advantage of that economic development philosophy. So it's about starting, it's about building the, inf the infrastructure uh, with individual businesses, with individual people. Somebody said Dunkin' Donuts earlier. I managed this Dunkin' Donuts over here, not after it was first open. The system managed, okay? I don't do that anymore. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Yes, yeah, somewhat. I just feel like what are the channels of government mm -hmm. that are you going to best support those actions? Uh, anything that uh, any section of government that uh, is able to foster what I think, which is what you think, is important. If it's uh, a committee for economic development, uh, if it's a way to bolster, um, like I guess the WBI, the Wachusett Business Incubator, or a program like that to expand that, as long as they are accountable. Listen to me carefully. They need to be accountable to the people that they're trying to help. Because nothing is more frustrating than says, hey, we were supposed to do this, and then it goes, Pfft. okay. Same thing here in Templeton. Templeton, um, I, I, I know the, the owner of the Dunkin' Donuts, so I can't, I got to be careful what I say. Uh, okay. um, but any small business, because if you go back in history, if you go back around the, around the early 1900s, 90% of most Americans owned and operated their own business. And if you compare the economic uh, power, that's when we were one of the strongest times um, uh, uh, America uh, was economically, so that's my focus. Uh, I can't. I wish I could give you more specifics, but I, I got to get in there and see what I've got to work with. But that's my focus, and I, and I take suggestions from voters. But I, that's I, I've talked to many people. They said my best ideas come from voters. So that's why I have an, a, a very much an open door, transparent uh, philosophy. Thank you. Good, my pleasure, sir. Uh, I have a question. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. curious. What did you do overseas when you were in the military? I had the most glamorous job in the United States military. I controlled 684 chemical toilets in a post. 
That was one of my jobs. Uh, I was a logistics officer. We ran, um, part of that was my job. Part of it was um, water filtration system, uh, a process, I should say. Uh, we were pulling water out of the um, Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And most of you, I don't want to take too much time, most of you have one of those charcoal filters on your faucet at home. Imagine that device the size of a tractor trailer truck. It's called a row pew, and, there's, and the U United States Army has several of them. Why they don't deploy them to disaster areas is beyond me. But, um, and that was part of my job, field sanitation, making sure the area was safe. That's why the gardener sludge landfill is a big issue for me. Um, we've, we've heard some, some other things today about anaerobic digestion. There has to be a better way. Why? It isn't just about Gardner. It's about Templeton, too. Okay? It just doesn't affect one town. Okay? So that's, that's a, big, uh, a very big deal for me. But that's what I did in the military as a logistics officer um, while I was there. So. Do we have anything from the audience? Otherwise, we're going to wrap it up. Okay. Well, well thank you very much, thank sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, we have uh, Mr. Paul DePaulo up next for the Governor's Council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all who put this together and are here on a Saturday morning. Um, this is great. I'm happy to be here in Baldwinville. I lived in Templeton for a couple of years uh, on Partridge Hill Pond right across from the Fish and Game Club, so I'm very familiar with the area. Um, I've had the honor to represent Templeton and 64 other cities and towns in Central Mass on the Governor's Council for the last two years uh, since I was elected first in 2020. Um, so I am here to not only introduce myself, but also, of course, um, to ask for your support this November 8th. Um, so I am an attorney. I'm also a former special education teacher. Um, I developed and taught an alternative programming for at-risk kids, kids dealing with abuse at home, kids dealing with trauma, kids who weren't finding success in a traditional school setting. Um, and you know, uh, I'll pause here for a moment because I have friends and family who are teachers now. And we all know it's become cliche, but mental health in our school communities is a real crisis right now. I worked, as I said, in alternative buildings where I was restraint trained, where kids were dysregulated on a routine basis, screaming, shouting, terrifying, <laughs> efforts at violence in the hallways, routine. We're seeing more and more of that in our kind of general ed public school settings. Um, so keep that in mind as I talk about what motivates me for this office. Um, the, the inflection point in my career, my adulthood, was my very first internship as a law student. I was in the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, working in the Child Abuse Division and the Appellate Division. And I can tell you what I saw in the Child Abuse Division opened my eyes in ways that I wish... Uh, you know, at the time, I wish had never happened. Um, children in our communities are suffering, um, and often they're suffering silently. Um, and kids who deal with abuse, right? I'm in the child abuse division in the district attorney's office. We're trying to prosecute child abuse. You can imagine how difficult it is. You need to, in some cases, rely on testimony from a child who's terrified to be in court, right? And, and, and the defense attorney is going to attack the child's memory and, and try to discredit the incredible trauma that they're going to have to relive in the courtroom. It's extremely difficult work. And these cases take years to put together. And so what I learned as a law student that summer was that all these kids who dealt with this horrible abuse, almost all of them were court involved as young adults. That's the path they get on. And we know that that's human nature, that's brain development, that's what happens when you're subjected to complex trauma as a child. There's an expression, uh, I don't like to sound wonky, but there's an expression in the field called the trauma to prison pipeline. And it's, it's a real thing, it's not some kind of slogan. Because I've seen it, I've worked with these kids. When you end up in juvenile court, right? And a, a great example I give is a kid I taught who was a 15 year old. He'd bounced around foster care since he was a child separated from siblings, reunited with siblings, multiple school districts over the course of years. It's no surprise this kid's going to be making bad decisions. And he did. Uh, he got caught stealing candy from a CVS in his town. That's not right. He deserves consequences. The problem is when it's a kid who's already court involved, they go before the judge at their next appearance and now they're facing court-sanctioned uh, discipline for stealing candy in a convenience store. 
I got to tell you, it's not going to work. A teenager making bad decisions is going to keep making them until they get support in their life. And there's good juvenile court judges, and there's bad juvenile court judges. And that's what got me interested in this role as governor's counselor, where I have the incredible uh, power and responsibility and honor to be voting yes or no on potential life-appointed state judges. Asterisk in Massachusetts, mandatory retirement at 70. So not technically lifetime. Um, what happens to these kids in court? As I said, consequences for what I consider typical teenage behavior escalate and escalate until they're on that path to incarceration as adulthood. Because they have no education, it's been so interrupted. They have massive trauma and issues that have been unaddressed. They don't have stable, responsible adults in their life. So it's no surprise they end up in jail. The latest numbers are that we spend 90 grand a year per prisoner in our correction system. That's a lot of money and I want it spent on keeping dangerous criminals out of our community. But I don't want it spent putting a 19 year old kid into prison to hang out with that population just so he can come out a couple years later and be right back in the revolving door. I'm fighting for a justice system that feels that way. I know my time's up. Um, I, I'm here to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Uh, you have a question? Is position on critical race theory being taught in schools? So my role is to approve judges, parole board members, industrial accident board members, which handles workers' comp, and also the appellate tax board. Uh, critical race theory is a academic discipline um, that I... Have, I was a public school teacher. I've taught in four different public school districts. Uh, I've certainly seen critical thinking taught. I have never seen critical race theory as I came to know and understand it as an academic in law school taught in our public schools. What do you think about it? What do I think about what? It's the, con the, concept. Concept of the concept of critical race theory? I think... The, the <laughs> You know, critical theory is a huge umbrella. I took in law school critical legal theory. Critical theory is the idea that you take a perspective and you look at societal problems through that perspective. So, I, I mean, as far as, like, is an intellectual exercise, do I think it's wrong to look at problems and say, I'm going to look at this from the perspective, I'm going to try to hone in on how race plays a role in this. Or in another setting, I'm going to try to hone in on how... Um, you know, bureaucracy plays a role. There's all sorts of critical theories. So do I have a problem with them existing? No, I don't. Yes, sir? Yes, sir. Just wondering, uh, when you look at a judicial candidate, uh, what are some of the more important things that you look at to decide whether or not to accept or reject a candidate? So temperament is most important. Um, you know, uh, people, when they land in court, it's probably one of the worst day of their lives. And so the environment in that courtroom matters. And especially if you're dealing in like probate court where you have family disputes, it can get really heated. And so if you have a judge who can't handle like taking a breath and calling a recess instead of calling someone into contempt or something like that, um, that's why temperament is, is really so important. Uh, we want to avoid patronage, you know, and it happens and it's happening a lot in the last few months of this administration. Um, and I'm not naive. I understand friends get jobs and this kind of stuff. Uh, but I am idealistic. I think put those friends in some bureaucracy department somewhere. Don't put them on the bench for a lifetime appointment. Um, you know, and it's a, it's, it's a digression, but I mean, we just had a few weeks ago, we put some on the, someone on the parole board, which makes decisions for parole at the end of someone's sentence, at, who had literally a, a sitting state rep who had zero criminal, like never interacted with the criminal system professionally or any other way. And we ran and we rammed him through because um, he was a, because for whatever reasons. So, um, you know, it's, it's temperament. It's that they're coming out of the right place in the community. You know, as far as Worcester goes, making sure that folks are familiar with the Worcester legal community is a, a tight knit community. And so making sure we have people who are going to fit into the, the, uh, the legal uh, landscape here and, in central mass is important to me too. Um, I think there was a woman in the back yeah. first. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you a question. Earlier in your discussion, you spoke of children at risk. 
yep. young people at risk. Yep. So how does that relate to you being on a council who appoints the judges that deal with these young folks? Uh, it, it, it's, it's all these, uh, it's all these things that come from perspective and job experience that I'd want a judge to have. So in the juvenile court, for example, and even in our district courts where your lower level crimes are happening, sometimes we call it the people's court. Um, you end up with a lot of, you won't be surprised, right? It's a lot of like 18 to 24 year old men are rolling through district court, right? Now, 18 to 24 year old men, like everyone else, deserve consequences when they do something wrong, right? However, I believe in pragmatism. Again, I don't want to spend that 90 grand unless it's going to do some good. So there are plenty of courts out there, and one thing I do as a counselor is to connect the dots. We have drug courts, we have addiction courts, we have veterans courts, which are great. In Western Mass, there's something called the Emerging Adult Court of Hope, which I'm really... Uh, excited about and I've been kind of connecting people from other parts of the state to it because the reality is again with my background both as an attorney and an educator uh, brain the brain doesn't stop developing until you're in your mid-20s it's just it's just reality it doesn't mean you don't face consequences but it means hey that 20 year old who's screwing up it's not too late like let's think about if there's an appropriate evidence-based diversion and you were talking about this the diversion programs treatment programs we need to make sure we're sending them to the right ones. So I don't want a judge who's going to give lip service to like diversion. I want to know, and I often ask, and if they don't know, I'm often connecting the dots. What are the recovery programs in your community where you're going to be on the bench? Do you know what's going to go on? Like, are they effective? Are they ineffective? Are they experimental? So it's all those things being open-minded to the science and to connecting the dots and being pragmatic so that we can use our taxpayer dollars effectively to promote public safety and not to harden these young these young men in jail. Good question, sir. All right. I um I actually my background is studying children in society. That was the name of my degree. You're a man working. after my heart. And I, I worked with in the juvenile and system. Okay. And actually, I worked with Straight Ahead Academy, which is out of Worcester, Massachusetts, with with juveniles, getting them back on track. Sure. Um, the biggest problem there was um, funding. Yeah. It's a Christian organization that's working with, with um, mostly boys coming out of lockup yeah. to get them an education, to get them the GED, to get them their first job, to help them get their, their yeah. license and all these parts, and actually give them hope for a future. Mm -hmm. And they were doing fine, and, and things were working out. I was working in their residential program, and the funding was the problem. Yeah, I don't know if because it was a Christian organization or what it might have been. I hope it wasn't for that reason. Yeah, but, but was, it, I saw a great, great change in a lot of the boys, and they were going in the right direction. Yeah. And then they found out that the program had to close. Yeah. And they reverted the things that happened after. Of just, course. They were very upset, very It, it happens quick because these kids taken, need stability. Something positive was taken away from them again. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And that's how they, and so you know, I don't need to tell you, but that's how they feel when they're pulled out of this foster home and put into that foster home, and here's your new school in the middle of the school year, and it, like it's it's all that, and you're right, it is funding, and that's that's the challenge, you know, yeah. like that's we've been talking a lot about funding. Where does where do the funds come from, and where are we targeting them? I feel really strongly that targeting them there is probably the best use of our money we could think of, because yeah. we get these kids on the right path. We're not paying to put them in jail, and they're going to get out into the community, build a life, build a family, contribute to our communities, all those great things. So, yeah. anyway. Do you think um, a judge with a good, strong um, belief in family is, is a good candidate for a judge? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. So that would be one of the uh, criteria they might be looking at is what, how they feel about the American family. Well, I mean, I feel like it sounds like you and I are eye to eye. Like, if you're going to have a family, you need to support the children, right? And so yeah, that's, but you that's need the to also that work. You, you also have to work with the family and family issues, also. The, the yeah, especially in our family and probate court, yeah. um, where you know, as I refer earlier, but I mean, I, if anyone's had to go through family and probate court, like, I sympathize with you. It's not pleasant. Now, is there a committee? Is a committee that looks at all the issues and all what? what's related to getting this child on the right track, and the committees that would deal with that 
overall issue of that particular child? Is there committees that look at that before they go to court? It's scattered, and that's one of the problems, I think. There's some places where there's really good programs in place, and it all depends on, like, sometimes there's school districts that are invested in this, and sometimes there's school districts that just haven't devoted the resources. And so, uh, I think I'm being cut off. No, nope, you, no, I mean, you can finish. We're tight on time, but, you know, it's... Yeah. it's it's, it's like the challenge on these, some of these other issues we're talking about, or even think about the firefighters and taking care of the, like, it's, it's, all these dots need to be connected, and so some school districts do a great job, and so, wow, now there's a liaison from the school that's working here, but some school districts don't have that, and so that's what contributes to this lack of continuity, which, again, for the kids, is like, the kids need stability, yeah. so, um, yeah. Right. I guess I can I'm do one, one, one last question. <laughs> Sorry. Do you know how many vacancies there are right now for judges? Uh, I don't know the exact number, but what happens is you have a rolling roster. It's rapid fire right now. Like, we're getting a lot more nominees than we have in my term. Again, because we're coming up against the end of a governor's term. And so they're kind of flying out. But uh, uh, I don't have the exact number. At any moment, it's a relatively small number, but it rolls. So every time someone turns 70, there's a new position that opens up. All right. Do any of those retired judges fill in? Uh, it happens not too much anymore. What happens more frequently is that a judge will reach the age, but they'll hold over until another nominee is put in place. There's some vacancies that sat for years. Again, all of a sudden, we're getting a lot of nominees. There's been some that were sitting literally for years. Same with parole board. Which, again, I won't <laughs> go down that road. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll uh, thank you, Mr. DePaulo. Thank you very much. Mr. Penn. Sure is. Thank you. And I'm going to welcome Mr. Gary Ganonic. I think I put it in. Close enough. Thank you, Terry and John. Uh, a little background on me. Uh, born and raised in Southbridge, Massachusetts. Attended University of Massachusetts. And uh, to date myself, my junior year in 1984, I voted for Ronald Reagan. Um, I've not looked back on the party since. And, uh, and I try to model uh, my thoughts, my actions around um, Mr. Reagan. I, I thought his temperament was great. His ability to rally people, work across the aisle. Uh, the, the Reagans of the world are sorely missed today. Uh, married my high school sweetheart 34 years ago, still today, uh, married today. Three adult daughters. Uh, we welcomed in our first grandchildren in the last year. As a matter of fact, on November 8th, something else is happening November 8th. I'm drawing a blank. Uh, the first one will turn one. So anyways, my family and I uh, own and operate All-Star Incentive Marketing, employs about 60 people in Sturbridge, Massachusetts, revenue is around $40 million, and uh, since I landed in Sturbridge in 89, I hit the ground running, Zoning Board of Appeals uh, in 91, school committee, I remain an overseer at Old Sturbridge Village today and uh, involved with my own Republican Town Committee. Um, I have been toying with the idea, as many of my friends and colleagues in Sturbridge know, of running for a state position for a while. Um, and yes, in full disclosure, I was recruited um, to take a look at Governor's Council. Uh, everybody in my district knows Jen Casey, um, Republican out of Oxford, the last Republican on the council. She held the seat for nearly a decade. Uh, <clears throat> she beat Mr. DiPaolo in, in 2018, and then he ran in the general unopposed uh, in 2020. Um, so I've, I've chatted with Jen about her experience there. And when I started looking at what's happening on the council, um, and anybody can do this if, if you're willing to uh, go to the uh, Governor's Council website and look at the live stream videos. I've looked at over 30 hours of it. And uh, quite frankly, as a law and order person, it's, it's concerning. Um, the council talks incessantly about compassionate judges that would reduce or eliminate bail. Um, you continue to hear terms like implicit bias and over-policing. Um, they push back on the expansion of dangerousness hearings, um, which, if you're not familiar with 58A, it's the ability to hold somebody pre-trial if, if they're uh, viewed as a dangerous criminal without bail. They, they don't have this in New York City. And if you follow the news, you know, New York City, Chicago, uh, cities like this are turning into, quite frankly, Thunderdome. Guy walks out of a restaurant a couple weeks ago, cold cocks a guy, puts him in a coma. The guy's walking the streets three hours later because they don't have dangerousness hearings in, in New York unless it's uh, first degree attempted murder. Happened again, guy wielding an ax at a McDonald's. Busted up the place, threatened six people with an ax. He was out three hours later. This council, 
<clears throat> and make no mistake, we, we've heard the term balance, and, and, and that's what I would like to bring to this council. This council has no regard for law enforcement, no regard for victims. I've got the endorsement from the Mass State Police Association, the New England Policeman's Benevolent Society, uh, obviously um, Sturbridge Police Association and others, because they recognize that, you know, we're going to lose a generation of cops. I know a lot of uh, young young police officers who, who have left. Um, we have one in our company that, that left the police force to come ship for us. Um, they don't feel like anybody has their back. So uh, that, that's, really, that's really why I'm running, is to try to bring some, some conservative values. Go to, the, go to the governor's council site. If you can suffer through the 30 hours that I have, you'll see the same line of questioning. Against 58A, uh, uh, against... Um, against any expansion of of, uh, of dangerousness hearings um, and the like. So that's my goal. My goal is to bring some sort of uh, stability, some sort of conservative values to a council that, and let's read the tea leaves here, folks. If Maura Healy is the next governor, we know what her judicial nominees are going to look like. And you need at least a couple people on that council to uh, okay, to mitigate that. Thank you. Um. Uh, the council, one of my colleagues is a retired chief of police. Uh, I can assure you he's interested in law enforcement. Uh, if you do subject yourself to the hearings, you'll see me express skepticism, actually, about implicit bias training, because I think it's glossing over what the real issue is. I think it's a feel-good thing, and it's not addressing issues. The Harvard study uh, addressed is an actual study that actually looks at objective evidence and shows that on certain crimes... There's massive disparities in the sentences that you get, depending on your race. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, yes, sir, in the back. I'll ask the same question I asked him. Um, when somebody comes before you and you're on the governor's council, what are the criteria you're going to be looking for in a judge? Well, if they've been at the district level, you know, what was their position on sentencing? Did they always choose the min minimum sentence? Um, where are they on bail? You know, we, uh, this, this is almost verbatim. Um, would you be a compassionate judge and reduce or eliminate bail where appropriate? Um, those would be the, the, the major two. And, and, you know, I didn't get to touch on this. There's a major transparency issue with the council. They voted to stop live streaming these hearings back in April. Uh, one of the counselors wasn't there. This counselor, and again, this, I'm just a reporter here. You can go look this up. It wasn't Mr. DiPaolo, certainly. But one of the other counselors calls the woman who wasn't there repeatedly uh, mentally ill. But she showed up and said, I cannot believe you stopped live streaming these hearings. People can't get to the governor's section of this. this, this uh, it's a small room. We're dealing with COVID. How can you stop live streaming? And her mental state notwithstanding, she's right. I mean, in our towns, you, know, you live stream uh, you know, conservation commission hearings. How can we not live stream uh, meetings where we're appointing judges? Under intense pressure, they, uh, they started live streaming them again. And then in the most egregious lack of transparency issue, uh, a Worcester lawyer named Jason Chan had a hearing scheduled for 3 o'clock at 2.15 with counselors missing. They opened the hearing 45 minutes before advertised. Mr. Jubinville, Counselor Jubinville was chairing that one, and he said to Mr. Chan, and this, again, I'm just a reporter here. Go look this up yourselves. I can give you the date. You can email me. I'll give you the date. He said, Mr. Chen, uh, you know, we've, we've all uh, had our one-on-ones with you. Again, transparency. I personally don't feel you need to make a statement. I see you have two witnesses. You're free to make a statement. Uh, Jason Chan said, I'm, I'm good. In three minutes, 45 minutes before it was advertised, they opened and closed the hearing. There is no, compa there is no discussion in this council about victims. If, if I dropped 20 people in a room and I said, watch 30 hours of this, and I'm not going to tell you the name of this group. But after you watch it, you tell me what you think the name of this group is. They would probably come up with something like, oh, this must be the, the counsel for the incarcerated, the counsel for the accused. It's not about victims. It's, it's, it's not. It's really not. It's about, it's about being fair to, to those that are accused of crimes. It's about minimum sentencing. It's about <laughs> eliminating bail. So that's, and again, I'm just a reporter. Watch it. Draw your own conclusions. Uh, I, if you can draw one other than that, I, I, I'd love to hear it. We had uh, any more questions out there? From no. Right, so I think we'll wrap it up.
I appreciate it. Thank you very much.